Kalispera. Good evening. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Parliament of Bodies. Kalos irthate stimbuliton somatum, as usual. <clears throat> as you know, from the, the time the exhibition has been open, uh, we have the chance now of uh, uh, speaking and discussing publicly with some of the artists that have been contributed to the exhibition and that came for the, the opening days. So it is my great pleasure to you to today to introduce to you to my uh, two dear colleagues, uh, curators Candid Hop Hopkins and Hendrik Volkers. And both of them will introduce to you to uh, the participant of uh, today's evening. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Paul, for uh, hosting us here. Um, at the Parco Lefteria, good evening to you all. Uh, uh, Kalispera, um, I should say. And um, yeah, it's, f it's very special to be here after the opening days to see sort of the Parco uh, Lefterias where it all began in a way last uh, September to be a place again where we can sort of actually discuss some of the works that we have seen. And it's a it's really beautiful uh, opportunity to um, do this with uh, Candice and uh, Nathan Pohio, who I'll introduce in a bit. Um, I think it's good to maybe um, give you a little context on where sort of Nathan's work is being shown, actually, just to ground uh, the conversation from the beginning. Um, Nathan Pohia's work in Athens is being shown at the EMST, in the National Museum of Contemporary Art. That is um, the first image that uh, just slided by. That's this one. Um, you can really see it right at the entrance. So when you enter the um, um, museum, it's in the lobby, actually directly um, on top of um, the right um, balustrade. And um, we'll, we'll talk about the image at length. So I just want to sort of point it out to you. Um, in Kassel, um, where the exhibition will continue in June, we'll show a slightly different image. Um, it's nice to compare the two now so quickly and closely next to each other, in fact. Uh, we'll show this image as a, a public installation, so as um, a photographic installation in a public space on a hill. It's sort of the only hill that the city has. Uh, it's called the Weinberg and um, it's basically a hill that sort of oversees a large part of the city and it very much has to do with um, the gestures and rituals of welcoming, hospitality and inauguration that this work in so many ways that we'll discuss uh, embodies and uh, enacts. So just to give you a sense of the place, because that's where we should start, I think, um, I'll introduce you very uh, quickly, if that's okay, and then we can just ease into uh, the conversation. But one more thing before I do, um, we've intentionally kept this on a very sort of conversational uh, level as well, because you've, you know, most of you have seen the artwork, you maybe want to respond to it, you have questions about it, we'll hopefully be able to, you know, answer a lot of these questions or give like uh, a context for them, but feel free at any point to interject or to raise your hand or however you want to express that you want to say something, it is fine with us. Now, finally, the introduction. <laughs> um, Nathan Pohio, who is sitting next to me, welcome, um, is a visual artist, um, a descendant of the Naitahu um, from, from the southern island of uh, Aotearoa, which is actually called uh, Aotearoa, the southern island of um, what is by n known by some as um, New Zealand. Um, he's a video and a photo-based artist, um, very much interested in cinema and actually the history of the moving uh, image in, in other work that comes to the fore quite um, profoundly, I would say. And let's say the uh, indigenous uh, sort of perspective has always played you know, an incredibly important role for you, and we see that in a lot of the work, and most certainly in the work that we're discussing this evening. Um, he's also, in addition to an artist, um, an assistant curator at the Christchurch Art Gallery. Um, I visited Nathan last year, yeah, it was last year, uh, in uh, Christchurch, and that's how we got the conversation going. Um, and to, yeah, be part of you know, such an important uh, institution there um, is really um, uh, commendable to what Nathan 
does in his life. Um, also a board member, long-term uh, board member of uh, a Christchurch art space called uh, The Physics Room. And he's part of uh, a collective of artists, um, actually spread across the North and the South uh, Islands, um, called Parmenu. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> well done. <laughs> And um, I mean, Nathan, you should actually talk a bit more about it later, but how I came to understand it, it's also very much a peer education, like uh, different artists, you know, giving each other feedback, uh, criticism, almost acting as sort of cultural uh, advisors to each other, but also to the outside world as well. And it's uh, a collective that, you know, seems kind of fluent and people come in and out. And I'm, I'm curious to talk about it a bit more because it's a fascinating aspect of your practice that I hadn't learned learned about so much. Um, but first thing first, I actually um, would like to give the mic to you, also to give people a sense of the photographic installation that is at EMST, which is this, um, reproduced as a, a banner in uh, the lobby. What do we see in the image? What is happening? Who is there? And um, just as a st you know, to ease into uh, the conversation a bit. Uh, uh, Kiri Kia ora koutou kato, uh, ko Nathan Kahu Petiti Pohio Taku Ingua. Uh, my name is Nathan. It's nice to be here. Kia ora Hendrik for that uh, lovely intro, and kia ora Paul and Candice uh, with me. Um, yes, yeah, so the image, uh, what is happening in it? <laughs> well, there's a lot uh, going on in, in different ways with the image, but um, let's look at it as a thing first. Uh, we have uh, rangatira, who are um, dignitaries on horseback uh, of various um, runanga around my island, uh, the South Island, Te Waipaunamu, um, also known as Te Waka o Auraki. And um, they are here on the occasion of the visit of Lord and Lady Plunkett, the representatives of uh, the Crown in New Zealand. Uh, us being a colonial outpost, if you like. Uh, they are the representatives of the Crown in New Zealand at that time, and they were visiting around the country and had come up uh, eventually to our nation's place of uh, Naitua Hūrere in uh, Tuahiwi Kaipoi, which is about uh, 15 minutes north of Christchurch. Uh, most of the people in the image are Naitua Hūrere, but there are other um, whānau in there as well, from other uh, nations, if you like, or we call runanga. We have 18 runanga on our island, and each has a takiwā, or a territory that they are uh, authority to, or responsible for, and so with the visit, they came to uh, Naitua Hūrere. So my, my question is, um, I think you knew almost immediately when you were invited to be part of Documenta what you wanted to propose in a way, and you were very interested in these images, I think, for this context. Um, one thing that we've talked, spoken quite a bit about is the idea embedded in these images of what host means and what guest means. So I guess I had uh, two things that I was wondering more about was both that topic and also how you came upon these images, how they came to Athens, and, um, and they had very particular protocols, or this image has a very particular protocol that comes with it. That's right. Um, so I'll talk to how we uh, have these images here uh, to start. And well, that's really through Hendrik and Candice, um, particularly Hendrik um, <laughs> noticing uh, uh, the light box work, which is the image that you saw previously. And he uh, invited me into Documenta to bring this work. And uh, we'd met, first met in Christchurch last year and um, uh, and Hendrik brought me over to Castle to look at sites and to dis discuss the installation of the work. And Hendrik was also quite mindful of how the work uh, would come to be there and how what uh, various tikanga or, or protocols, cultural protocols, were going to be required to have it here. 
So uh, these conversations were the first conversations, if you like, how how to uh, uh, how we were going to process this or set out a cope up for it. Um, what was the other bit? I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how you first came to find this image and why why oh, it's important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what a bit more what's going on here because this is quite a loaded. Both images are very loaded, um, and you've chosen specifically to show in Athens a kind of before, and then it's the second image is in fact just taken what would you would imagine to be you know twenty seconds afterwards. Mm. The um, <laughs> uh. I can start it up a bit, and then you add if you like. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, something that actually triggered me when I um, I was in Auckland last year when I saw the image at the um, Auckland Art Gallery, and um, it was not this one; it was the other one that you saw, which is an image of a perfect sort of staging, you know? Um, it's, it's, you know, people are obviously, you know, required or asked to sort of pose in a certain way, and it's a very representational uh, sort of uh, image in a way. And at the Auckland Art Gallery, it was literally sort of the portal through which you had to walk to enter the um, museum, which actually embodies, literally, because I was walking underneath it and sort of experiencing this image in that particular way, actually embodies a lot of, um, let's say, the undercurrents that are sort of present in this work very strongly, which is, you know, a ritual of welcoming, of inauguration, which you can talk a bit about a bit more, at, like, you know, what is actually the, what's happening after this uh, image, but also the ambiguity, of course. I mean, these you know, the Lord and the Lady in the car um, are representatives of a regime that is actually, at that point in time, was in a very you know, vicious legal battle over land that, let's say, the English, you know, claimed as their own, but of course, you know, was sort of uh, taken from the Maori. And so, let's say that in this moment, which is 1905, um, you have this, you know, this lord and this lady arrives on the island. The protocol requires that they are welcomed and inaugurated uh, to that land. But it's land that, you know, maybe not them literally, but the regime that they represent has in fact already taken. So it's an ambiguous image. And maybe you could tell a bit more about actually that protocol of inauguration that they were actually going to go through after this moment. Absolutely. Um, let me just um, uh, explain how I did come across the image. In 2015, uh, I had been charged with, or I picked up the, the role of um, decorating the site or project managing the site of Tamatatini 2015, which is our national cultural uh, competitions. We love to get up and sing and perform haka and uh, and do this together as a as a people, uh, and it's a national. It's a, an opportunity for the people of the tribes of the, the the country to get together and do this. It's been 24 years, I think, since we were last the hosts of uh, Tamatatini in Christchurch. It rotates. And that is because it, yeah. Yeah, it rotates from one tribe to the other every year, every two years. Sorry, one tri one tribe to the next. So it'll be another. You know, I'll be seventy or something. I think by the time I, it comes back around again, and uh, so it's a huge privilege to be a part of this big, big project. And uh, while we were establishing our co-papa for this, uh, our process uh, for it, we um, poor media who was here and performed ceremonies the other day, which I'll get into, uh, was project managing the whole event with her sister Rangi Marie and um, the Waitara Cultural Council, and um, we were looking, they were looking to maps, to map the site of the event uh, in response to, or according to the site of the first pa out at Kaiapoi, where we whakapapa to, whakapapa is genealogy. And a pa? And the pa is a, um, is a stronghold for when you are under siege. You you uh, you go to the pa, and from there you are able to access water and food, and uh, have palisades and, and trenches, etc., to to protect your people. Um, 
So I went site uh, looking. I went looking for images uh, of the site from Kaiapoi, the PAR site. And while doing an image search on Google for that, I then struck this image here, uh, which totally blew me away. I wasn't prepared for this stunning uh, representation of my people in this very formal uh, configuration in photography. It's a glass plate from 1905 by um, CJ Jennings for uh, what was the Canterbury Times. And um, I just kind of was quite dumbfounded by the image when I first saw it. This is cropped, by the way, from the original plate. They both are. Uh, I wanted to evoke a cinematic kind of um, feel to the work. And I also wanted to evoke, if you like, I've had a huge fascination in Westerns for a very long time. And I kind of see them as an um, uh, interesting feel to consider because there's issues of uh, colonialism, uh, there's issues of land and people within the land, and also how people are represented in those films, for example. The people of the land, the Tangata Whenua, are generally off in the distance and are part of the land. And uh, that's always interested me. Um, whether that's a conscious decision or not by the filmmakers, it's, it's uh, always been interesting to me. Um, so when I f saw this, I was immediately reminiscing, uh, it reminded me of um, the film posters for uh, The Magnificent Seven. And uh, The Magnificent Seven, of course, uh, is a remake of Akira Kurosawa's The Seven Samurai. And um, so I kind of felt like, well, here's a beautiful kind of lineage there already happening in this image and, and of my own people. And I, I fuck up to about two or three, four maybe uh, of these uh, men on horseback. Which means related. Yeah, I'm, I'm related to them. And uh, so there's, there's names there that we uh, still have, you know, the, the people I know, the cousins and so on. Uh, now. So um, I think that the when you're analyzing the image, I think something that Hendrik and I were also really struck with is is this interest in relating it also to a kind of cinema, which implies a kind of performativity to these images. And so I think in this one, which we see first, we see in Athens, it's before the image has really been orchestrated. It's this moment just before, and so it's often these, this would not necessarily the, be the image that would circulate in, in the Canterbury Times where it was first published. No, that's right. This, and this image here wasn't known to me when I made my first uh, artwork. I was commissioned, I was approached by Skate Public Art to uh, consider a public artwork with them and uh, they just got fully behind whatever idea I wanted to do. And this, um, the, the, the previous image actually wasn't the first idea. This was the, the second or third uh, because of how we had to shift around the city. We had uh, suffered um, quite a major earthquake several years ago that made certain sites unapproachable for public artworks, which was kind of a good thing in the end because where we ended up drew from me the image that we ended up using, the, the very formal um, photograph. Once I had the site locked down, once I understood where we were going to go, I then instantly knew what uh, we would, I would want to put there and, uh, and that I wanted for it to be a light box and that I want it to be large and that uh, I wanted it to be like evocative of a cinema drive-in, which we don't really have in New Zealand, but you know I've seen in so many movies. And uh, it was an opportunity to do something like that in a public space, but in quite a specific public space as well, I should say, because uh, it ended up on the bank of the Otakaro River, uh, the Avon River, which runs through our, uh, our entire city. And um, the site was Memorial Park, which is where uh, civic ceremonies take place and they are generally to do with um, remembering our soldiers from, from World War I in particular, the Anzacs. And uh, so it's a place where we hold uh, our Anzac uh, memorial services. It's very close to the Bridge of Remembrance but it's also close to another particular site there. Now 
I wanted the image, the work that we made, the sculpture uh, light box, the image here ends up becoming 2.4 metres high and 8 metres wide. And it's suspended in the air uh, 4.9 metres into the air. So it has quite a uh, presence um, wherever you go, wherever you are around it. And it kind of demands uh, some attention, if you like. Uh, but it's a quiet work as well. Um, and of course the image itself kind of um, uh, kind of uh, it's not a loud image for something that takes mm. up so much space but it uh, demands a particular kind of silence I think which I really like. It's a very sort of dignified image as well. Yeah, it? certainly. Um, and really that's also what it's supposed to represent of course yeah. as well. Um, but also maybe uh, we are going to talk a bit about how sort of the conversation that we've had, but also how the image and the object, because you know, in uh, Castle it's an actual light box installation, sort of travels from uh, Aotearoa to the respective cities that sort of document the 14 years. But for me it was important also to go back to that moment where your work actually made me go through the portal, which was your work, into the um, museum itself, which actually inspired us both to you know, imagine this image, um, this one, actually in the lobby of the main venue of uh, the Documenta 14. Um, and I'm curious actually maybe to reflect a bit on, let's say, the, the, the potential relationships that an image like this has, which is both affirmative and uh, ambiguous, um, has to your perspective on the museum and, and how you see your relationship to that. The, um, the, the experience that Hendrik had intuitively uh, folded into uh, was, and where he saw it at the Auckland Art Gallery, it was acting as a nangutu, that is a, a, a gateway, a, a portal uh, bet between two spaces. And, uh, and he intuitively walked beneath the work, which is exactly how uh, I was hoping that the, that the people would pub, um, interact with the work and then enter from there, keep walking across the forecourt of the Auckland Art Gallery and enter the museum. Uh, I had a complex situation uh, with taking a representation of my ancestors from my own takiwa, uh, to a hiwi and uh, Christchurch City falls into that takiwa, up to Auckland. Uh, land or territory? Your yes, the, the territory that we are uh, responsible to. And, uh, and then taking that to the North Island into someone else's takiwa uh, that we don't have a whakapapa to. That was really quite tricky for me. And so um, uh, what I ended up pursuing was how to um, consider this work uh, because it's so representational uh, on someone else's takiwa and um, that was to find whanaungatanga. Whanaungatanga is a relationship to the place, the land, the people, something that you uh, relate to and what I ended up finding fortunately was a Gottfried Lindau portrait of Hakapa Te Atua too. And he was a chief of Naitua Huriri uh, from the 1820s and 30s who fought Te Raupraha uh, at the site that I was looking for maps at earlier that I was mentioning. And uh, so I asked the museum to please hang this portrait so for the duration of the exhibition uh, so that then there would be this whanaungatanga between my work and the museum and also allowed my hosts uh, Ngāti Whātua and the other 10 or 11 tribes of the Auckland City District to have me on their takiwa as well. So there was a purpose there. And we thought the idea of host and guest here was complex. Yes. <laughs> it's very <laughs> yeah. complex there. Yeah. Um, but what, what I think this opened up here and what we some of us witnessed um, when the work was being installed 
um, at the Amst was also this, I think, need to think about not just um, the space of, of negotiation, but how, in fact, you cre can create a, a relationship that, that's meaningful. So that, in fact, I think a big part of this process is not simply the hanging of the work. It was also the, the fact that it comes with a certain kind of protocol. You also invited uh, members of, of, of certain communities to come along um, to inaugurate the image in a very particular way. But that's not only it. You've also then been looking for these relationships, very specific ones, between other ancestries and other Maori people, our ancestors and other Maori people here in Athens, which I think is, is a really interesting part of the project. So. Yeah, that's right. Um, this takes us back to Castle again. Uh, in a conversation with Hendrik, and uh, because we were invited, the artists were invited to make a proposal um, to not just be in, in Kassel, but also to be in Athens. And I presented um, Hendrik with uh, this image here as a proposal for Athens, whereby uh, two photographs taken on the same day by the same photographer on the same site as the, with the same people would um, resonate between the two cities and form whanaungatanga between the two cities, a relationship between Kassel and Athens. And um, that in itself is, is really significant, I think, to a lot of dialogue that's going on at the moment, but it's just something that we felt uh, was something to pursue. And, um, and in terms of whanaungatanga here to Athens, we presented this proposal to Adam and he when we're having this conversation like we're having now I'm explaining my not just my work but my uh, cultural responsibilities to the work because it is representational of my people and uh, so I need to make clear that not all my work requires this necessarily but because it is representational it certainly does require this uh, by by my people's um, uh, standards, if you like, or, or way of being in the world. So the relationship here was first hint, you know, uh, presented by Adam, who said, uh, we will send you to Athens to look for sites, the sites that we have there. But he said, you need to visit the, um, uh, the, world, War the, the world War II Memorial uh, Cemetery in Athens because you'll have your people there. Of course, he didn't necessarily know exactly how, uh, how much of a well that ended up becoming. We only just discovered a few days ago uh, how significant this is. But uh, of course, um, that was significant. So um, Michelangelo and I both got in a cab on one of the nights and did visit the site and found um, the New Zealanders there. And... Uh, when we had our, s now I'm going to jump forward now to just a few days ago when we installed the work and then had our ceremonies for it here. We held a, uh, oh, what, what did we do? It's Wednesday, just yeah. to give you um, <laughs> seven thirty a.m. <laughs> bright and early, uh, pre-opening. Yeah, so museum was quiet, <laughs> which was very necessary. A quiet moment in the museum that morning, and uh, my I had arranged for when it became you know uh, confirmed that we were coming here and we were bringing this image here. Uh, we had to. I then had to. Uh, go through to my upoko, to Mighty Toe, my cousin to Mighty Toe, and say, we need to, uh, how do you want for the um, our various processes, uh, our tikanga to be performed here? So he took charge of that and assigned two people to come out to uh, Athens from, from New Zealand, from down home, and accompany me. They arrived on Tuesday, uh, after flying 30 odd hours and then having a little bit of sleep to arrive here in the morning and Fakato uh, Modi, uh, the ancestors in the image that is over at Emst. So we got into our ceremonial dress that we were able to um, easily bring through customs and 
Uh, they perform a bit of a story to that too because normal ceremonial dress includes uh, feathers sometimes from rare birds and this, this yeah. is something that customs does not like yeah that's, uh, that, uh, uh, that's exactly right and uh, Pumidia in her infinite wisdom and great experience uh, bought a ceremonial dress with her that was uh, not only going to be appropriate for the ceremony but also was able to uh, get through customs w uh, without causing too much delay. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> we get here early in the morning and uh, it was really quite an incredible um, ceremony for those that were there. Uh, kia ora, thanks for coming along. Uh, it was really quite a special and quite uh, emotionally heightened. Uh, we entered a very... Um, sacred and uh, heightened sense of uh, um, ceremony uh, that morning and uh, was certainly carried out with so much mana, I have to say, uh, by Yayin and uh, Poor Media. Uh, Poor Media, just to maybe share a bit of that uh, experience because it was, was a very intimate uh, ceremony which was also very much intended, um, just if you uh, like uh, permit me to explain a bit, um, to, you know, on, on sort of a formal level, inaugurate work, which means um, acknowledging the sort of uh, ancestors that are sort of represented within it, um, to sort of settle the work into that, but also to, you know, let's say create that relationship with the ancestors that yes. are sort of buried here. Yeah. And it's, it's a very, indeed, as you say, it was an extremely heightened moment. Um, and, you know, to give an account of that is, is, is very hard, but something that I was very overwhelmed with myself during that moment is that when um, you know one of the people perform not not that's not the right word doing the ceremony um, when she stepped into the ems which was empty by then it was it was the work was hanging there already she started crying actually quite unstoppably and I thought oh my god I have done something horrible unforgivable so it was like is everything okay is everything okay and everything was okay because the reason why she was so sort of touched in that moment because she said you know she could hear the answers to speak so loudly and they were sort of present in that room and so it's, you know, it gives me the chills so just to think about it and it, it, it paved the way for the work to be inaugurated in a way that I think was extremely special, but also in keeping with the protocols that is required, actually. Um, and, yeah. That's right. The, um, that's, that's absolutely right. Poor Media, dear Poor Media was, uh, uh, of course, very tired and wanting to perform this ceremony uh, and, and put all of her energy into it while uh, she was, uh, as she revealed later, was getting an ear bashing from the ancestors saying to her, what are you doing? Hurry up, get this going. Because they'd been up for, you know, 12 hours or 20 hours maybe and hadn't been settled and uh, they didn't know where the hell they were and what their connection was to the place. So Poor Media um, uh, worked through all of this and started to own uh, the, the Whakatau Māori along with Yayin who... Um, also, his power, his presence was really quite powerful and uh, really anchored, I think, uh, the whole situation as well. Uh, I think um, something that we we ended up speaking about is how you know an image that uh, could seem inert to some, in fact, uh, carries with it uh, both the spirit of ancestors as well as certain protocols as well as certain songs that I think were were needed at that moment in time not only to welcome but also as you say to settle the ancestors and one conversation we were having is how uh, artworks such as these begin to challenge uh, what can be a very um, Western framework for museums and uh, the idea that, you know, uh, objects come out of their crates, they're handled by people foreign to them, they're placed on the wall, they're never given a proper introduction to place as well. And so there's a kind of agency to, to 
the people in this image as well that was given through through this action that I think is really important to talk about, especially with um, a lot of discussions we're having now about uh, the decolonial museum, for example, or indigenous practices. Um, and it wasn't just this image that carried with it certain protocols, it was also um, the mass of Bodic inside as well uh, by the Kokokiwak artists. And the, then this extraordinary connection between um, someone you brought over with those masks too, that I didn't, w none of us were expecting. Right, that's right. Um, Yayan, who, who performed the, the male part of the ceremony, his first wife? That's right. Is um, for those of you who who were here during the thirty four acts of freedom, his first wife is uh, Chief Robert Joseph's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> That's how small the indigenous art world is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we had this uh, really really strong uh, binding connection and commonality, if you like, uh, uh, which we weren't expecting, and and just. Uh, has deepened this experience uh, so much more. We um, now, I'd just like to um, add that once this perf uh, performance was uh, completed, once, sorry, once the ceremony, sorry, was was complete, we uh, then went and had a kai. We had a feed, uh, had some food, which uh, takes us out of the the, the, sa the sacred status, the tapu sacred status that we had entered into during the um, ceremony, and food makes you Noah, or Noah, meaning it neutralizes, and so we became neutral again. That is what Noah essentially means. And then we quickly jumped in the car, in a taxi, and shot across to the um, Athens Memorial uh, Cemetery, and um, did a whole other ceremony again, uh, to the to the people of, of particularly of New Zealand there and specifically our ancestors and at there we found um, an ancestor who we believed was from the same place from Tuahiwi and uh, Pua Media emailed Tamaiti to check on the name and Tamaiti confirmed yes he's one of ours and I have a photo of him here somewhere so uh, there you go that's kind of how we roll, it's kind of how we have to do things. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, I think just to sort of uh, trigger a bit what sort of Candice was saying as well, like um, it was one of these moments in this uh, sort of uh, exhibition that you start seeing art objects for what they really are. I mean, at the very least sort of extensions of life, but also full of life, you know? Um, and that, that was for me an absolute, it's a beautiful moment to acknowledge that and to enact that in that way. But we didn't quite end there. There was more. Uh, just to make you fully aware of, you know, also, also the life that was happening around and because of these uh, objects um, in uh, Athens is that um, what is sort of customary, I would say, is that you know when sort of a representational object or a cultural object of this sort you know enters a certain foreign land, which in this case uh, is the city of Athens, the country of uh, Greece, like you know it's sort of customary to acknowledge the owners or the representatives of that land for it. So on Friday we had, let's say, an other sort of ceremonial sort of touchstone moment, um, which was the visit of the Ministry of Culture uh, of Greece. Uh, to the Emst, which we took as an opportunity to, to Mihi, we uh, we uh, our uh, ceremony that day was a, was a Mihi, which is we're to learning all kinds of terms here, new <laughs> <Yeah>. new words. <laughs> uh, so Mihi M I H I is essentially to greet and acknowledge the people of Athens. In this case, the people of Athens through uh, the Minister of Culture. And so that was our opportunity to take care of that um, n very necessary uh, moment as well, or, or pr uh, process. Uh, and the work um, also, of course, acts as a nanutu here. And so you enter the space, the exhibition space, uh, alongside or beneath the work, and then enter into the space where um, yeah, we're, we're, we're the work of Bo Dick, uh, who's just recently uh, sadly passed away, uh, where his work is installed, mm. and into the exhibition further on from there. 
I'm I'm very interested to maybe go a bit deeper into the ceremonies and sort of what 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 their meaning is even more. Um, because you know, at, at a few moments in these exhibitions, there are moments of r sort of rituals or sort of ceremonies, and they all sort of you know perform very different functions, of course. And I was sort of triggered by, let's say, how this particular ceremony that we enacted on Wednesday, but also on Friday to a certain extent, although less maybe, um, or sort of also invocations of a different time and of the ancestors coming out of a different time, but still with you. In order to understand that fully, maybe you can narrate that even a bit more. Sure. Hendrix uh, leading me to a conversation on how, on really what is a world view. And uh, that is one where for Māori, we, Whakapapa is our means of identity. Our genealogy is our means of identity. And uh, we... So how you introduce yourselves. Yes, yeah. yeah. So we introduce ourselves through our whakapapa, um, and sometimes that can go on for a while, depending on who the person is. And um, but we take our and we have our ancestors before us in all times, essentially, and uh, that reiterates why we must take these processes and uh, wherever we go, we're not privileged to put these processes aside because we have our ancestors before us in all times. That is kind of, uh, one way to explain it um, is that when we think about time, we kind of think of ourselves uh, as moving into the unknowable future with our ancestors before us. So if you like, a, a, an easy way to conceive of this is to imagine you are moonwalking into the future. That is, you're walking backwards uh, into the future and you uh, are in a state of where the future um, is a constant presence. That is, we're in the now and with our ancestors before us. So that is to say, we see our past before us as we move into the future. Everyone keep to pie with that? You all right? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's a perspective where you are uh, you have your entire genealogy in front of you as you move into the future, and of course, because the future is unknowable, it's a constant presence. So we we were having this conversation, uh, Nathan Hendrick and I. Um, just a little while ago about this concept of time and also how this was an opportunity to really learn from one another because Hendrik, you were saying as you were writing the text on Nathan's work, you were trying to figure out, I think, the right way to articulate this. And uh, But then through that, there was a real generosity, be not only through Nathan, uh, but also through other um, cultural leaders, exactly. No, absolutely, because I mean, um, you know, I'm an art historian, and however much I want to sort of deny that, my concept of time and history tends to be a bit linear. Um, <laughs> and so this 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 has been an incredible learning curve, also to, yeah, you know, let's say, disentangle certain histories, you know, and to think of time in very different terms, actually, um, and also to understand that this. What I would call like you know an invocation is is maybe that, but it's also just an ever present or something you know, and that that's why I was so sort of you know intrigued, but also so triggered by the sort of ceremonies that we did uh, on Wednesday and Friday, like you know like what what kind of presence are you invoking and 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 how does it sort of travel with you, and also this is a very sort of practical question because I don't know this yet. Do you need to unsettle the artwork as well? It's a really important question. Yes, <laughs> it is essentially the answer. Yes, that um, process needs to be untangled at the end. Um, but, uh, and how we're going to do that, I'm not quite sure just yet. <laughs> Pumidi and I would This has never happened it. as well. This is, it's maybe yeah, good to like right. note is that this is actually the, like the very first time that like uh, a president like this has been created. Hendrik. No, 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 no. We do have um, a president. Sorry, we do. Uh, I, I, I 
must point out to uh, I must uh, remember um, to Maori, the Torian exhibition to Maori around 1984. Uh, so there is actually a precedence uh, for this. How how we go about it uh, and what what kopapa we establish, I'm not I'm not quite sure just yet. Yeah. It, um, there were a couple of things that it brought to mind, but when I was thinking about, uh, not sure how much this adds to it, but I in trying to wrap my head around also this idea of this potential, Hen Hendrik, you were calling it a fold in time, it reminds me of, it's still a customary practice uh, among people in living in the far north in Canada, uh, different uh, Inuit communities, to name a grandchild after a grandparent. So even then that uh, parent to that uh, child sees also that person within that role. So it's as though you're calling your child almost as though they're your parent. So they take on from the very beginning a very elevated position in society, even as a very young person. But it's the sense that through your ancestors, they're also reborn through new generations. Yeah, that's, that's right. We, um, uh, we name our children the same way. And uh, so we do kind of put them up uh, uh, position them quite highly when we when we name them, and, and generally after a, a particular ancestor. For example, my middle name is Kahupatiti. Kahupatiti was a, um, a chief from down south, uh, around Muruhuku Way, which is the Southland area of the South Island, and uh, he was charged with protecting children from the onslaught of Taraupraha and his men when they attacked uh, Kaiapoi. And uh, so it was his job to protect the, fam the, the whakapapa by taking so many children, but not all the children, uh, down with him to Murihiku and then kept them safe. As I understand, in our family, we say that he took them to Ruapuki Island and um, protected them there. So... <laughs> Yeah, names and genealogy and and the value of the, of that is is um, is deeply important. So my middle name recalls my fifth great grandfather. This is a bit of an open question, mm -hmm. and um, I'm just wondering: has there any ever been a situation? Do you, can you imagine maybe a situation where you would choose? not to bring a work like this in you know because it feels like you also have a responsibility almost to you know make sure that you know a representational image like this actually can settle into a situation yeah. and that you don't sort of you know upset the ancestors that are in fact right next to you <laughs> um, or you know uh, in front Isn't of you um, and so I'm just wondering have you ever heard of a situation because you know, like when talking about guest host relationships, it's often, as we've noticed very well and respect fully, mm. it's a fragile thing mm. as well. Mm. And you have to walk a very fine line. Mm. I have to say, um, uh, the way we've, the way that Documenta has approached this has been um, uh, one of not knowing, but what, but recognizing that knowing is important. That Becoming to know, if you like, is, is, is so very important. And that was one of the things that struck me from the beginning. Dare I say learning? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> learning. <laughs> and um, uh, if I can maybe um, offer another example of, if I go back to, to Māori again, and my recollection, recollection of um, that exhibition, and yeah, you might have to give a bit of context because sure. it's a, it's a I would say time. the most important uh, exhibition of, of Maori art that traveled internationally. So. Yeah. It was a, um, uh, an American curator came out to New Zealand and visited many nations of uh, Maori in New Zealand and um, uh, worked with and began, she went through a particular journey I should say and her uh, learning and understanding of our culture to how uh, to go venture into curating an exhibition uh, of Māori art to be taken into uh, America. Uh, it was, uh, that was, I think, unprecedented. And some of the things that are, we are a people that kind of 
don't really um, shift our perspective on our on our needs to do things and and uh, that our tikanga uh, is in place. Uh, so for the freighting of some of these works, uh, particular tribes insisted that the crates, uh, that the ancestors, the carvings that um, embody the that the, within which the ancestors are embodied, uh, weren't uh, boxed, if you like, or they weren't completely boxed. So the crates that were made for them were, in terms of where the uh, face looks out, were cut off and left open so that the ancestors could see each other in the, in the plane and see each other in the uh, crates and not be put into a box that was completely black for the duration of uh, transit. So there you are, there's, there's, the kind of, uh, there's the kind of value we place on our representational works. And I think the thing that was extraordinary about that exhibition was not just um, the different protocols that were put in place that were coming from those things that were that were being sent over as well uh, but was also from my understanding and maybe this is a generalization but it was the first time that new zealand itself was saw these things as fine art that's, ex that's exactly right maori art for the first time had been recognized in new zealand as um, living works of art rather than artifacts of a culture and uh, that was a big shift culturally within New Zealand, yeah. I have a question for you. Um, <coughs> with an artist, maybe he wants to say something. First comment. <laughs> First comment of the day, <laughs> which is a good sign to open it up very soon as well. <laughs> um, <coughs> as an artist interested in the photographic uh, image and in the moving image, which are images that can be reproduced, how do you distinguish between representation and reproduction? Because, you know, it's, 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 it's a tricky question, I can imagine, as well. Because the images that in 1984 were, you know, sort of distributed in other parts of the world and needed to go through you know, similar uh, protocols as well as you know, this image as well, but there is a difference that this image was reproduced. And, and, and it's a tough one. I, I think as well, and I was wondering you as an as a visual artist rooted in a culture and you know a ceremonial sort of uh, custom as well. How do you navigate that? Yeah, that's really tricky territory. I um, I just know that um, with this work comes responsibility, and um, and I have to consider. The uh, work in Emst as 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 the work, which is different to this here, um, uh, because uh, it's given the status of an artwork and put in space or put in a space, sorry, for exhibition. So I guess when we get to that point, we have to engage with the responsibilities there. And that's with the um, uh, with the uh, light box as, as well, of course. Yeah, I think that's how I navigate that that territory. I guess I try to make it as simple as possible, uh, in some way. And but it's not simple, really. Yeah, yeah, it is quite complex. It, which is a good moment I have to open up. If you have any questions, remarks, things that you didn't quite sort of click with or even uh, understood, please feel free um, to indicate it, because that's what we're here for now as well. Um, oh, please, Paul. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for giving us uh, so much background on the image, because I think it's totally needed. And I remember very well the first time that you spoke about this work, like in curatorial meetings, and when the decision of uh, having this work at the EMS was taken, uh, having in mind that the EMST is the National Museum of Modern Art, um, I was quite impressed basically when the, the work was finally hung and basically entering into this hall, the first thing you see, I mean there is no other way, is basically this work. So you're immediately confronted to it. And so I was 
myself quite um, travel and puzzle at the same time, not knowing what to think, because you enter into this museum, which is supposed to be like, okay, the Greek uh, modern history of art, and suddenly you have this image, and somehow you cannot make any sense of it. So there is this moment of uh, basically like both the genealogy somehow and uh, any kind of Western epistemology of uh, our history that is like falling apart. And you're like, okay, what am I seeing? Am I, is this related somehow to Greek history? Because of course the first thing that you're expecting is something that is bringing you to the Greek stereotypes or the ideas that you have about Greekness, right? Um, so I think it's uh, really like a, a very powerful gesture. And even more now that you spoke about the way you really see this image, which has nothing to do in a way with <laughs> the way we will decodify the image from a kind of a yeah, Westp Western, yeah. Uh, let's say, history of art or aesthetics or whatever, right? Mm. But how do you, now that you have seen this image and that you've been a few days here in Athens, um, what do you think this image can make to this museum somehow? I mean, because this image, as you speak about it, is quite powerful. Just yeah. You're giving this image like an agency that we don't give to images normal, normally. You know, we have, we have the images and we have them there, like we enjoy them or not. Mm. But this image seems to be doing something. Mm. So what would be your idea what this image could be doing to this museum? And uh, what yeah. would you expect about I think uh, it's really lovely, Paul, lovely observation and, and a uh, good sort of area to look into because I think that the work um, uh, in, its, in, in, in different ways activates space around it, if you like, or it, it, it activates the space of the museum, the entry point of the museum. I think it's an excellent place and it's the right place for the work to be here in Athens. And um, there's a whole sort of backstory to that, but that's not really important. I think it's where it is and what it's doing. And I think maybe what you're sensing is how it's activating the space. I kind of think of it in those terms, perhaps. Well, I, I definitely do, and perhaps that's what it's doing. Um, and I think it does this in maybe a couple of ways, in that uh, the position of, the, of our ancestors here uh, the dignity, the sense of dignity that's um, inherent in the image uh, by the by the dress, by the uh, um, being mounted on horses, um, and also the the point where um, nature and um, technology are kind of meeting in this image as well, and uh, I think it. Uh, that's quite a crazy juxtaposition of vehicles and uh, uh, also ideas around um, indigeneity and nature and and uh, and what have you. Yeah. One of the things that I um, immediately appeared to me when I was in front of this image, from our own way of uh, understanding images and the kind of learning that we've been doing about like being in front of images what i immediately thought was who am i like basically with whom Great question with whom i you know am i the person that i'm like uh, coming here with the car and or am i like one of the the people that are like waiting for them in horses and being myself someone that has been in athens for the last two years you know, with the Documenta 14 project and being in this position of sometimes not knowing I am the foreigner, I am the local because I'm from Spain, as you can hear from my accent. And so you never know. So I think that that was one of the very powerful uh, things happening with this image as well that basically forces you to say, well, I don't really know anymore if I belong to these, to the ancestors or I belong to the, let's say, the new technology of the, the people coming with cars, right? Or the horse. Or oh, the horse, yes, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong with being a horse. <laughs> Maybe it's the best position. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're, you're right to ask, uh, you really struck something there, and uh, one of the first things that's amazing that uh, one of the first things we ask Ma as Māori 
to anybody is no hiakwe, who are you? And uh, it's important because um, we want to know, we want to, to form a relationship. We want to uh, understand that this, whoever this person is that we uh, seen before us, who was a stranger, say, uh, we need to understand who they are and what their purpose uh, is in, before us. Uh, that is that sort of harks back to our our ancient times of um, uh, where we would fight amongst ourselves and over territory and and um, things. And uh, so, no here queer is a really important question, not just for those reasons, but more significantly here in terms of identity and establishing an identity, if you like, uh, within the work or um, p possibly in the space between you and the work. That's what I was thinking about a lot, was in fact the space between the car and the horses and how everyone in this image is so strongly, in a way, uh, demonstrating their identities. Everyone is in regalia, even the people in the car. Um, so that's why I think that it's 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 so very interesting in that way, and also this moment just before the image event, which I would qualify as the next picture, which is the formal picture, and the idea of the image event for some is is the sense that um, certain images are produced in order to enable the the act that follows in a way. It's not the documentation of an act, but it's in fact to enable an act that follows. And we could say that, you know, of course, what was following was uh, was, a, was colonial history. This is very... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, now, look, what you're seeing here is a part of um, a ceremony that's been um, uh, re-established. Um, okay, we'll get to you. Um, the... Uh, typically what happens these days in, in Pōhiri is is uh, the manuhiri, the manuhiri are the guests, right? And uh, you have this area, we call a marae, and it's, uh, it's, it's where our, our formal processes take place. It's a place for discussion, debate, uh, establishing things. And uh, so anyone that's coming on to the marae for a particular purpose, whether it's a discussion or it might be a funeral, it might be a wedding, it might be um, to discuss as a people where we are heading. One of the first things that happens for people that are from outside our marae is to welcome in them in. And uh, so what you're seeing here is an early, early, very early stage of that, where once upon a time our people did get on horseback for particular dignitaries, and rather than let them gather themselves at the gate to the marae, we'd get on horseback and go down the road and meet them down there and prepare them for the Pōhiri ceremony. And so that was be became part of the ceremony to prepare them and uh, for the welcoming onto the marae. That's what we are, this is the documentation, if you like, of what we are seeing. So it's a very special and very rare cultural memory for us. Uh, and as of 2015, it's been reenacted again, it's been put into practice again. And in, uh, in, in actual fact, we don't know which image came first, which is also no. quite interesting, actually. But we we can imagine this one comes first, or perhaps it came after. I well, this is the dispersal. Of yeah, it, you know, I, I can yeah. think it's that really speaks to what uh, Candice was saying as well. But there was a question in the back. Please go ahead. Um, thank you very much for all the information. Um, you mentioned this uh, process called uh, decolonization. Um, do you think this is a real thing happening today? Because if you look at economic uh, statistics, the uh, inequality and exploitation of the tree cont by European and North American companies is worse than ever. Yeah, I, I don't think there is actually any actual decolonizing going on. I'm, that's the position I, I have decided to take for myself. Uh, I think we've pursued uh, for generations um, 
means to have settlement with uh, with the um, uh, with the with the crown in in this in the instance of my country. Um, no, I, I've decolonization is a word that's sort of come up um, in some from somewhere, and I I honestly don't believe it as an actual thing. I don't. Uh, I think things are happening under the mantle of a supposed decolonization, but I don't believe it is actually uh, truly a decolonization at all. Any more questions or responses? Um, yes, please. Hello. Um, first about the picture and um, something that Paul told that uh, he, he he faced himself in there. Well, it, it, me as a Greek and a non-critic of art, it's. I haven't seen the, the 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 art. I'm gonna go and see it, but I can I can see it as a welcome, and it it's so obvious to me who is on the horse and who is on the car. <laughs> the Greeks <laughs> and the Germans. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's so obvious. <laughs> God, and you know it's it's it's. On 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 a direct second thought, and I'm sorry to say this, <laughs> I have no uh, intention to to insult anybody, but it's a very fine dialogue to waiting for barbarians of Biennale. Well, uh, the Biennale made a, 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 it has a title of of waiting for barbarians and say who is the barbarian and so on and the stereotypes anyway. But it, it yes, well, I do want makes to say, it I quite of <laughs> yes, so I do think you know like okay. So so I think it's it's a fine a fine dialogue between the uh, the title of of Biennale. Waiting for the barbarians, and and this one—it's a fine dialogue. I think we should take a second look to that. Anyway, the question about um, what I wanted to say to, and I really wanted to ask because it's it uh, as a um, a strong picture in my mind. It was when uh, the in Standing Rock in uh, North Dakota with the pipeline, the whole uh, thing and the gathering of uh, natives and um, from from many different places of uh, of America, of, of the continent. Uh, and I watched one day Maori doing the haka there in the middle of, of the cold and the, and the snow and I think everybody saw it. And, and I was wondering, <laughs> and you gave me of course some Assets today with the, with the generations that go forward in front of us, the older generations that go in front of us. But can you can you tell me something more about about yeah about about how the Maoris sees this uprising of other natives and how they 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 uh, act how they see it uh, in comparison with their with past generations and their ancestors that I that is very interesting if if sure mm. sure sure thank you um i i um that's there's uh, some interesting positions there i just have to clarify that what what we are seeing here at tanga de the the people of the land and the uh representatives of the crown we are not barbarians and we are not any other culture we are maori we are Tangan de Fina, we are the people of the land. So um, please be mindful of that. We are of the world and in the world, and we're not anything else. Uh, kia ora. Um, in terms of uh, our Māori at, um, uh, at um, Standing Rock. Standing Rock. Thank you. I, I had a film title in my head and I knew it was wrong. That's <laughs> 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 just my nerves. Um, uh, I saw the video of, of, of Māori at Standing Rock uh, performing the haka and 
look, I I have to um, be responsible. I can only speak for my people. I can't speak for them and for their purpose for being there because Māori don't represent all Māori in the things that they do. We This is really specific uh, why I'm also bringing this image here because I fuck a papa to the people in it. If this was an image, and even a more powerful and more beautiful image from the North Island, I wouldn't bring that here because it's not for me to do that. And not only would you not bring that here, there, but also the people of those lands would tell you that it was not appropriate. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I could I could go to them and seek permission, but uh, I would a doubt uh, to be granted it. Um, and and uh, B, I would struggle with it actually as as a work of mine uh, because of um, the parameters I guess I've put upon myself in terms of uh, uh, responsibility to my people. Um, I, when Standing Rock was ha was happening, my uh, sister-in-law spent the majority of time there. She started a uh, radio station. Her name is Autumn Chacon. She's a Dene or Navajo uh, activist. Uh, my husband also went for a period of time. Um, and as Nathan says, there's no singular position. Uh, Raven went because he was invited to go by Chinupa Hanska Luger, who's an um, artist living in Santa Fe, who's originally from Standing Rock, the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. So he was invited there. Um, I think what also happened uh, to a great degree is it mobilized um, Indigenous voices broadly and Indigenous agency, but it also brought up a lot of uh, questions of protocol um, that were, and questions of, you know, problematic questions of complicity to, um, for example, a friend of mine who went to the, to the protest when she was there, she was greeted by uh, a non-native activist who was telling her what the protocol of the camp was. And for her, that was super disturbing. It wasn't from someone who was from there, but it was from someone, a, a volunteer from an uh, activist organization. Um, and what, was al what uh, Autumn also relayed to us was that uh, people were coming as a kind of activist tourism, right? And when they were leaving, they were leaving new, brand new sleeping bags, brand new tents as garbage by the garbage bins. And so, you know, sometimes these movements, we like to romanticize them, but they also expose a lot of differences. Uh, they expose differences, not just cultural differences, but also differences in... Um, economic standing, you know, the ability to just fly somewhere because there's a there's a movement happening. And so I know for a lot of uh, indigenous people, even um, a friend of mine who went from uh, northern Norway there, they had to fundraise in order to go. They just didn't necessarily just were able to buy a ticket somehow to North America to go. People carpooled. Um, so anyway, that's just a, a bit of an aside. No, it's... Uh, we... Um we have our territories that we can speak for, and um, you know, though there's eight, like I said, there's 18 territories by various runanga on our island, and um, I fuck up up to a few of them, um, but I am bringing the work that I is it is correct for me to bring. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Please, um, may I bring her the microphone? Oh, okay. <laughs> wow, I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> I she weren't asking me. But th one of the things that fascinates me about this picture, and I would love to see the 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 previous or the, the post picture, is that there's an oil stain under that car, and it's it's a leak, and it's the only thing leaking there, and. <laughs> You know, I think it portends for a future where extractive, I don't think it's as big there. I mean, it's hard to tell because of the proportion, you know? Well, it's just curious, you could, because you could measure that leak, which is bigger, do you know? If you could, right? I mean, I don't know, but it's fascinating to me, and it, it just portends, it portends standing rock, it portends all of the, the reasons that, the colonists wanted the land was for money, you know, just yeah. right in that leak, right there. And um, 
They would I, need more and more and more resources. Yeah. <laughs> it's just horrible and fascinating because it seems like the beginning of and that's, that that's moonwalk, yeah. <laughs> you know, which also reminded me so much of Walter Benjamin's, the, was it the thesis on history? The angel of the history. The angel of history. Yeah. Being thesis on the philosophy of history. Thank you. <laughs> you know, yeah. And then also juxtaposing that with the moonwalk of Michael Jackson. You know, which is so glorious to think about Michael Jackson as the angel of history, right? I mean, just thank you so much. That could be a whole new movie, buddy. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I just want to say thank you very much for drawing out these entanglements. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Kia ora, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I should, I should um, acknowledge um, Tessa Laird for first planting the idea of uh, moonwalking into the future from our perspective. Uh, she's, a, she's a writer in New Zealand and um, she was talking about um, ooh, a friend of mine and all of a sudden I'm forgetting. Uh, um, I'll, I'll come back to this, okay, but yeah, Tessa Laird and uh, Verse first cited that for us. Cheers. Yes, please. Hello, hi. Um, I'm not sure exactly who to address this question to, maybe it's just the panel, but could you speak a little bit more about why you chose to use the word hospitality in the title of the event this evening? Certainly. Um, that's a good one too, because uh, the, I chose the word hospitality because that is essentially what is going on here uh, in, the, in the photograph, acts of hospitality uh, are, are happening. And I'll expand on that for you, actually. Let me just get my notes. Um, there's a few things going on in this image, and uh, what's um, the people on horseback, as I was saying um, to our friend before, uh, Tanga de Finua, the, the, the people of the land, and their role here is mana whenua. Um Hang on. No. <laughs> Sorry. The role of the people on horseback is tanganda whenua. The role of the people in the car is mana whenua. Mana whenua meaning visitors. So tanganda whenua are the hosts and the mana whenua are the guests or the visitors. So that's how I came to use the word hospitality because of the act that's um, being carried out. But there's some other things that I'd like to introduce if that's okay. Um, and this comes from uh, Tamaiti To, Dr. Tamaiti To, Upoko for Naitu Uh Now I'm going to need my glasses. <laughs> There's not. No, it's fine. It's fine. These all sort it all out. Bingo. Here we go. So um, Tamaiti says, the work encapsulates um, Naitahu values or specific Naitahu values. Kaitiakitanga, stewardship, manakitanga, caring for others, whanaungatanga, relationships, tohutanga, expertise, tikanga, appropriate action, and rangatiratanga, leadership. And uh, so those are the things for us that are being evoked in the image because of the people in the image and the... Um, the activity going on in the image, yeah. Um, is there a ceremony if uh, someone is a guest and insulting the <laughs> one that is um, hosting? Um, well or is always kind of like every all the relationships are kind of okay? No, I mean, definitely it not be, okay all the you time. Know. <laughs> <laughs> what and are you doing if a guest is insulting you in your house? Because what's going on here, in a way? <laughs> yeah, sure. It's, let me let me it explain. It could be also an act when you go with a car. Well, yeah, the car I mean, would the car would be left things. at the gate. Is there? A, is there? A, I want to just ask with the for horses. for personal reasons too. If there are ceremonies that you can actually show to the one that is guest that you have been insulted. Sure. Okay. So that 
uh, takes us further along in the Pōhiri process, um, whereby, so our guests, if you like, are, are welcomed onto the marae. A part of, um, yes, there is a time for that during the Pōhiri um, process, if it's required. That happens outside the whare, <laughs> to start with. The whare being, the, or the uh, whare whakairo or whare nui, a whare whakaira will, will say because it's the carved meeting house and um, it's where our a major part of our art uh, stems from and it's also where our representational works start as well, our carvings. Um, now, to your question over arguments, mm, insult might be a little too strong a word but discussions, let's say, whereby, um, so the the manuhiri speak first, oh, I'm not sorry, no, the tangata whenua speak first, and that, that is to welcome the, um, but there's also, that's, well, this is, gee, boy, I have to take another step back, actually, sorry, because the the first thing that happens is the, the um, karanga. The karanga is performed by the, the woman of the place and uh, uh, the calling uh, is responded to by the woman on the manuhiri side so their role is to clear the ear yes to make to make the ear clear and that everybody understands that we are here and we are coming in peace and uh, that we may have whatever happens afterwards excuse me that uh, we're here in peace, we know each, we're going to know each other, we're going to understand each other, we're going to work towards that, and we are going to do whatever has to be undertaken in this particular time. Now, then the Tangata Whenua speak and, uh, and welcome uh, the Manuhiri, and typically what happens is uh, that's, a, that's the time where you start to... to you know, air your grievances if you've got them. And it might be over uh, some family member saying something about some other fa someone's family 50 years ago. <laughs> and it's still not forgotten. <laughs> but it's also a time to laugh about it, you know. And so-and-so uh, and -so said something to so-and-so and we've never forgotten it and blah, 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 and this is going to go down and when you know we'll always remember them for that and uh, so there's 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 that happen and then of course the money who to get to respond of course and then they'll go well you know what blah 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 someone say wasn't so cool and blah blah I did this and uh, but then it all gets kind of get pushed aside because what always tends to happen around this is just like people start laughing because you start firing stuff off across because you've got to remember also the um, the space is um, set out in a particular way. The conversation happens with the tangata whenua here and the mana whenua way over there and there's this big space called the pai between and that's where the grievances go but it's also where the calls for love go and it's also where the calls for understanding go. There's a space actually for it, yeah. We, um, we have these uh, as part of our ceremonies because we are a people that don't want to fight anymore. We've, we have a huge, huge history of intertribal warfare. We are also a people that suffered immensely to uh, colonial and settler uh, <sighs> unjustness and uh, deception and uh, uh, and just outright uh, racism and everything else. Um, so we generally don't really insult each other so much but we might recall something and uh, and put a few digs in here and there but uh, uh, there's there's uh, really not much in the way of fights going on anymore. It might actually result in generations of issues uh, where people won't talk to another people or something. Uh, but yeah, that's a, a, I think that's about as, as safe. I think that's safe to say as far as it goes. And I'm looking at the camera because I know that 
eventually someone back home is going to see this. They are seeing it right now. Are they? Kia ora There are no more questions. Oh, there's one over there. Just a, just as uh, maybe not so small comment on the the coloniality. So there's this very famous book uh, of Franz Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth, and in the first paragraph, in the first chapter, he presents some ideas of uh, what means to decolonize, and maybe it's an important thing to to bring here in order uh, for we to understand what this means and not the, not just use this word until this until this word uh, lost its its meaning so um so fanon says one one of the first things fanon says is that we cannot um that the colonization never happens through a path of magic through a magic trick and that the colonization only makes itself intelligible through the same process of its of its performance. Like through the colonization, we can understand the colonization. We cannot talk or imagine or understand what means a decolonial world without pass through this process, which is in Fanon's word a, a program of complete disorder. And I want to remember also some, uh, something from Ella Shoah in a text called Notes on the Postcolonial. I'm sorry for being too, like, too many quotes, but maybe it's important right now. But uh, Ella Shoah tells, uh, she criticized the notion of postcolonial, and one of the, uh, her main critics to this notion is that uh, the notion of postcolonial kinds of break the possibility of knowledge and recognize who are the perpetrators of the violence you are faced, you are facing. And for me, that's really important because I'm totally into this thing of of becoming the boundaries of myself, and not being like um, and uh, closed in some kind of identity. That's that's my fucking point in life. But at the same time. Uh, for me, it's important when she says, and it's important that we hear it very well and carefully, when she says that it's really clear for the people from here who is in the horse, uh, who, who are the people in the horse, who are the people in the car. It's really important because then it becomes possible to discuss it in a in a manner which which is uh, which is just and. I, I totally f uh, feel you, your point on no longer be fighting and fighting and fighting. But when I think about uh, the, the, the colonial present, the colonial situation in Brazil, for example, and I'm uh, thinking with like indigenous uh, populations, the things they're facing right now and black populations and trans populations, Sometimes we must acknowledge that there's a point when not to fight is not an option anymore. And there's a quote from Magneto X-Men, which I love to say <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> that the peace was never an option. And for so many people, the peace was never an option. And so many people have never uh, got to this place when not to fight is a possibility. And we must acknowledge this anger. We must create this space for discussing it. And concerning, and concerning Documenta, which I think it's super contradictory and I, want, I, I don't want to make like a, a final sure, perspective on it. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing, I promise. Uh, yeah, I've just read these days a letter, an open letter for all the viewers and, and participants and the people who's coming here, for the people from the, from the squat movements uh, concerning the evictions that are happening here and also pointing so many contradictions and problems that must be unalleged if you want to use, even use this word, the colonization here. If we want to use it, we, we must give an account to what is happening and to the angry that this, this thing is producing across people. It's important to analyze it. It's impossible 
to shut up, to silence it. So I just wanted to make this point here. It's not, it's not like a personal attack, no, no, no. so it's, it's more like an opening. To, we are all here right now. We yeah. are all participating in it. Some, I came from Brazil to be here because of that. So I'm not outside of it. I'm not claiming an, an outside position, just to say. Would you, you like to please land? Yes, um, kia ora. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Look, um, the uh, points that you make, uh, in, terms of in, in terms of First Nations rights uh, to whatever the oppressor is, whether it's a colonial oppressor or whether it's a... Um, corporate industry or some other heinous kind of thing, uh, look, we stand beside you in, in every possible way. We uh, acknowledge you and uh, identify with you because of our own story. But we, um, we can't assume to, for, for the things that we say about ourselves, to, um, and we don't, because it's a position of responsibility as far as I think I'm concerned, to not um, assume or envelop uh, another people's culture in, into uh, my experience and conversation. So, you know, power to you, and and uh, uh, it's it's good to have this conversation. I completely agree. Uh, I don't know how I'm feeding into it or anything really. Um, I'm, and I apologise for that. I hope I'm being useful in some way. But really, in terms of First Nations struggles whatever they are, and words like decolonization and post-colonial, I kind of struggle with because I don't see the world as post-colonial in any way, and I don't see the uh, any actions as um, decolonizing, really. I think, I think uh, and I think that's why it's so important to have these, uh, that's why I'm really glad to be here and to bring my work here and to have this conversation with you and with the people that have spoken up tonight, because I think it's very brave. I think it's a brave thing to get up and uh, and have these conversations, and I agree that they need to be had. Mm. I do. Um, maybe just sort of two points. First of all, um, I'd really like to applaud you, actually, because it's a point that I wanted to make before, but perhaps a bit too uh, impassionately. Um, and so to actually, let's say, go to the meaning of a word and the sort of, sort of the suffering and sort of uh, the context that comes with, with it, which is uh, colonialism. And I, I also feel that this word is being used and it's you know, subject to a certain amount of uh, sort of uh, inflation, which it should and can never be. So really that's, that's sort of like a pre uh, context for what I'm going to say, and sort of the anger that you speak of, um, I very much agree, and I think um, there's going to be many more sort of uh, conversations happening here in the coming months where we can address directly or not the position that sort of Documenta 14 has in this city on this land. But I do want to ask, maybe if anything, <laughs> um, that the anger is also channeled to sort of like uh, entities where it should be sort of channeled towards, um, in, in a way that I think the intention, from how I see it, um, very much f for being here, is also to let's say, go into certain histories, which has been discussed at length, actually, also to look at sort of the relationships between two lands, actually, and to work for an exhibition that is so much rooted into German history. Um, and, you know, coming outside of that, I really had to go into it as well. Um, and to actually be part of a proposal that in somehow seeks to expand that notion, but also to question if something is attached to a certain history, if something is attached to a certain money as well, German money, if you will, um, does that define the manner in which it can be part of a, a public realm, a public atmosphere? Are those two things determining for how public and where it can be public? And so I've never 
this is a bit naive maybe even, but here goes. I've never, you know, with all the intentions, seen a show sort of the presence that I've had here as part of a colonial uh, apparatus because it was about, you know, sort of redefining what like uh, a publicness means. And this is, you know, just one aspect of many, and, and I'm intentionally calling it naive because there are many things that I'm not taking into uh, consideration here, which I should, and we will, and we have. Um, and I hope that you know, there will be a lot of opportunity actually to have what you call this space of, you know, sort of discussion um, where we hopefully can be sort of kind, but there's also a place for anger and fear and anxiety, which we all feel, I think. Um, so I want to thank you, if anything. Something, but maybe I rather other people to talk because I often talk very much. <laughs> Thank you for this contribution. I think it's really interesting that we're discussing about these um, very current subject subjects in this in this way. I think that it's really interesting that through the process of the documenta here. A lot of light is being thrown in the on these relationships. And it's interesting that the relationships between the colonized and the colonizers are addressed in the exhibition itself, and then also by the act of the e exhibition, and then also criticized through the act of the exhibition. And I personally really hope that this leads to a dialogue more than to an angry fight. You know, and I think uh, that would be, and I really loved what you said about how, you know, you uh, throw things at each other, but then there's also laughter. And um, yeah, that's what I'm hoping for, that through the discussion and also maybe through voicing anger and explaining positions to one another, this can lead to a better understanding. Yes, yes. I think yes. I think um, what I've been noticing yesterday and today is um, different. Um, well, first of all, different cultures in the room, different experiences in the room, uh, different needs to um, and how to express things. And I, uh, this is definitely a fantastic forum for that. The um, if I can add something to the work uh, on the topic of. Uh, the coloniser, and I don't like really like the word colonised, <laughs> um, but I, I use the words tanga de whenua, the people of the land, and the representatives of the crown. Um, and what is one of the things that happens here after these um, photos are taken is the Governor General and his wife and his party are, are welcomed onto the marae, and they at that point, you know where I was talking about the pie and uh, the place to do the shouting? Well, the shouting took place, and the, sh and the shouting was over. The agreement that Māori have with the Crown, according to the Treaty of Waitangi of 1840, which Māori, uh, when talking about the treaty, talk about the Māori version of the treaty, and that relates to the Declaration of Independence of 1835 with uh, King William. And, uh, and so the grievances were presented to, uh, let's, I don't know if it's shouting actually, and I really doubt it because that's kind of not how we, how we do things, but the grievances were brought once again to the fore um, to the Governor-General at reminding him of his obligations as a representative of the Crown to the people of New Zealand. And uh, to, to complicate things a little bit more, a gift was then given to um, Lady Plunkett, uh, which was a small, uh, it would have been a, a kitty, uh, and it would be a kitty of a particular um, masterful uh, status. It would have been an, an object with a lot of um, status upon it presented to her, which would be a very finely woven um, a kitty is kind of like a purse, and um, for want of a better word, and it would have been no doubt 
woven by one of our um, a woman who are master weavers, and it pro it would have been probably made from a particular flax that, when stripped down to its finest uh, threads, becomes very shiny, very quite beautiful, and able to be woven super intricately. Um, so uh, we have we have a way of how we do things that's developed over time. Uh, I can't critique my brother's uh, position and how he wants, you know, how he feels. <laughs> and I'm certainly not doing that, okay? Uh, I, you know, relate in, as a, a person who's on the different stage of a particular process. I mean, we've, what I mean is we've fought the settlers, we've been to war with them, we suffered too many losses, we had to find other ways to deal with those people. So we started to deal with them by um, becoming members of parliament and um, doing as much as we possibly could to affect parliament. And I have to say, after I should say, after 170 years of this, we are still at it, and but we are just getting stronger. Uh, education was something that was denied to us. Uh, or it was an education that was preparing the men to be good farmers and the women to be good farmers' wives. Uh, but then if we, for example, after World War II, say, we came... Uh, and the amount of things that our people did in order to try and uh, settle and, and offer hospitality. So let's take, for example, um, the first settlers arriving in the 1830s and 1840s. Well, actually, let's go forward a little bit f further along to the 1850s, and people were coming in mass from England, and thousands of people started arriving on, on our ports. The, the uh, colonial office hadn't really, had only just managed to get this treaty under the uh, past. Anyway, people arrived, and I'll talk about my, uh, our, I should say, location in the country whereby I can speak uh, confidently. Uh, the boats, the ships arrived. People came off the ships with all their stuff. And the world they were entering into was one where it would cost them as much as it did to um, get their stuff over the hill. Because the, because the people arrived into a harbour that was an old volcano that had blown itself out, and the water came gushing in, uh, you had to take your stuff over the hill in order to get the flatlands that was um, being prepared for farming. It cost you as much to get your stuff over the hill into the, the flat plains as it did to come from England. That's the kind of world <laughs> they were entering into. So by the time they did, um, and a lot, most of them actually carried their own stuff over the hills, you know, clocks, uh, grandfather clocks, etc., were all carried over the hill and there's, there's a lot of um, history around the, um, the bridal path that became called. And uh, as a child uh, who grew up at Rapaki Bay, further around from this harbour, I can remember bits of ceramic plates washing up onto our beach as a child because I kind of think that actually a lot of people started to ditch a lot of ceramics and things like that because it was too heavy to get it over the hill and they weren't prepared to maybe part with what money that they had to get it delivered to them over the hill. So I think a lot of stuff just got thrown off the wharf and then eventually over over the years sort of got in little fragments washed up on our beach. Um, now, what's my point? <laughs> oh yeah. Survival. Oh yeah. And 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 uh, survival and hospitality actually, because what happened was now we've got to go back to the concept of um, Tangata Fenua, the people of the land. So these people started arriving in their hundreds and what have you, and um, my people fed them, and also housed them, and gave them shelter from from the rain because they had nothing. They had maybe some had some tents and what have you, but we. My people harvested acres and acres of vegetables to be able to feed them and fished to feed these people because that's the role of the people of the land. You look after your guests and you supply your, your food and your shelter to them. That's what for me is a partly going on in this image is, is 
that same practice is being put forward by the welcoming ceremony going on here and uh, the cultural values that that has. I can only speak, brother, from my perspective as Māori, tangata whenua back home. Uh, yeah. Kia ora koutou katoa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, the, the translators that are working behind these blocks and they, you cannot see, they've been telling us that uh, they have to go because it's 10 o'clock. So uh, for the sake of uh, the translators, but I also think that we already had a, like, a very good discussion today and we will continue. Uh, we will stop now and uh, thank all of you enormously, really, but especially Nathan for being here with us today and everyone that participated in the in the debate Candice of course and Hendrik thank you so much <laughs>